Um, Steve. Yep. Yeah, recording. Um, uh, Steve is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, he received his PhD in zoology uh, from the University of Hawaii, uh, his master's in marine biology from Florida Institute of Technology, and a, um, his biological sciences degree with honors in marine bi biology from the University of Guelph, Canada. Um, Steve has conducted research uh, for various agencies, including the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, he's published over 60 papers in peer-reviewed journals uh, and presented at numerous talks at scientific uh, conferences. Um, he supervised, uh, uh, you know, well over a dozen graduate students, uh, myself being fortunate to be one of them, um, and postdoctoral researchers. Um, he served on numerous committees, uh, maintains a strong public outreach service, uh, primarily through television documentary appearances, such as Shark Week and on Nat Geo. And he's also served as an elected member of the Elasma Brank uh, Society and has over you know, 25 years of experience studying the biology of sharks and rays. And so we're very happy to have you here today, Steve. Uh, Definitely a pleasure to see your face and um, I'll go ahead and I guess we'll just make sure you can share your screen and then once everything's good we'll just go ahead and hand that off to you and uh, yeah you can you can get rolling. Sounds and then, good. Let me try and share this now. Cool. And then I guess just one other reminder we usually you know the talks we usually go about 45 to 50 minutes and then we leave the last 10 minutes for questions so either through the chat. Uh, which everybody can put their their questions in there or we will uh, do some oral questions at the end as well so. All right, sounds good. So, so take a look. Can you can you see this now? Can you see a, a screen with a whole bunch of little sharks swimming around? Looks perfect, at Looks least on perfect. my view. Great, great, fantastic. Cool. Well, um, thanks so much, Kier, for the uh, the invitation to come and speak to you guys today. And once again, my most sincere apologies for uh, um, for being a few minutes late here. I uh, the the strangest thing I was. I knew I had to do this, and I said, I've got time to take my little boy to the beach this morning. He has no school today. So we're at the beach paddle boarding and having a good time, and uh, it uh, just the time got away from me. And so I, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm here finally. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get right into what we're talking about. I think it was a great day, uh, just because it uh, gave me an opportunity to get out on the water and, and reflect on what it is that we've been doing for the past um, decade now, and uh, that's looking at this seasonal migration of black tip sharks. And so what happens is every winter, we have a whole bunch of sharks that uh, appear off our shores down here in South Florida. And uh, every winter, it gets a lot of media attention. And people will, you know, contact me and say, you know, what's going on? What's, what's happening with these sharks? You would be concerned because when you, uh, when you see them, there's, uh, there's a lot of sharks right there, right? You've got sharks right up along the beach. Um, I don't know, can you see these people standing here on the, uh, on the beach here and all these sharks in the water right, uh, right off the, uh, the beach there? And you can literally just walk along the beach like this, like this guy and look off uh, the side and see all these sharks. One, two, three, four, five, you know, a bunch of them just sitting right here in the water, right where the, uh, the people are. And some people are actually fortunate to live on the beach and actually literally have sharks right in their own backyard. So wouldn't it be cool? You live in the house right here, you walk down the stairs and there you are, you've got black tip sharks right off your, uh, right off your beach there. And so, um, I mean, I would be delighted to have black tip sharks in my backyard. I don't know how these people feel, but I would like it. And so um, what happens is every year, because we have this, um, this seasonal influx, these, this large number of sharks coming in, it gets, it gets a lot of attention because people, like I said, they're seeing the news reports. They see the, uh, the news helicopters that fly by and uh, it's on the local news saying, you know, thousands of sharks off our beaches, uh, you know, whatever, uh, news, at, news at 11. Um, and they'll, they'll get this idea of what's happening. Well, what happened was I kept getting calls and I kept telling people, well, these sharks migrate down here. These are privately black tip sharks. They come down here in large numbers in the winter time and then they stay for a few months and they go north again. And that was unfortunately the extent of the knowledge we had. We didn't know much about the migration of these, uh, these sharks, their movements at all. And so um, wait, I had an opportunity, I had some uh, unrestricted funding, um, uh, which doesn't happen often, but it was nice to get. And when you get that, I said, you know what? I'm gonna finally address this question. I get these calls every year and I don't really have a good answer because there's very little 
in the literature that talks about the movements of these of these animals. And so I'm uh, I was noticing that a lot of these news reports are from the helicopters looking down and seeing all these sharks along the beach. And I thought maybe the way to do this is to study the sharks from the sky. Go up in the air, look down and count the sharks, see how many there are, see where they are, um, and get an idea of this uh, seasonal influx of these uh, migratory predators right off our shores here. And so I was able to take some of this funding and we rigged up a plane. I'm, I'm also a pilot, I fly. Um, and so we have a Cessna 172 that we rent and we rig a high definition video camera out the window of the plane and then a, a still camera behind it as well for even um, like, like backup basically. And then we fly a transect. We fly the plane at a low altitude, 500 feet off the water, nice and slow, about 70 knots. And uh, we initially flew only from uh, Boca Raton, Florida, up to Jupiter. Um, and that covered Palm Beach County. That was our initial uh, run for the first few years. But then we were able to expand the project. And subsequently, we now fly all the way from Miami up to Jupiter, covering the whole uh, Tri-County area. Okay, So we've basically doubled the amount of sampling. And uh, we're collecting data on the seasonal abundance of these sharks along the whole stretch of coastline now. Well, what we're able to do, what the, what the um, survey looks like is this camera mounted out the window of the plane and aiming straight down. This is the sort of cartoon view of what it would be. Here you've got the plane at the top of the screen here. And here you have the beach, a little beach umbrella. There's sharks in the water down here. And as we fly along, that camera is aiming straight down and it's able to capture a field of view from the shore to about 200 meters off the beach. So I tell people, think about the length of a football field and then double it. That's more or less what we're doing here, okay? And we know that there's more sharks out there. Uh, we see them on the other side of the plane, but we're only concerned about the ones that are immediately adjacent to the beach, right? That's, that's where the people are. And yes, we know that the numbers that we're reporting are an under uh, estimate of the total number of sharks, but I mean, there's only so much you can do. You can't count the whole ocean. Uh, so we're just focusing on this narrow band, this 200 meter band between the beach and that 200 meters offshore, okay? So here we've got uh, the sharks, um, excuse me, the, the plane flying along and counting all these sharks that are close. And the nice thing is um, even at 200 meters offshore, it's still pretty shallow you're still no more than about four meters deep. And so what that means is uh, we're able to see all the way to the bottom. It's not so deep that you can't see what's happening. And we have a nice light sandy seafloor down here. All right, nice light sandy seafloor. The sharks are uh, dark little specks and it's shallow enough and the water uh, we fly on uh, days when there's uh, low wind for the most part. So um, the, the water's clear, it's not too turbid um, and we're able to, uh, to count the sharks. Well, I'm gonna show you an example of what this looks like. What does the camera actually record as we're doing these sorts of aerial surveys? And this is um, the field of view of the camera as you're flying along, the video camera that's constantly recording. And you have the beach along the left side of the screen over here. And uh, we uh, have the strut of the plane on the top of the screen. On the bottom, there's a little tire down here. And every one of those little dots is a shark, all right? See how many sharks there are, all right? Now, if you were flying along, you'd have about two seconds to tell me how many sharks there are. You ready? Go. One, two, stop. How many sharks are there? No one has hazard a guess. You can't do it. There's way too many. You, you can't do it in real time. That's why we have to record uh, the video, take it back to the lab, download it, and go through very slowly so you could count the numbers of the sharks here. So if you were to look, just since you're curious, there's in that frame alone, there's 1,678. You could not have counted that in the two seconds that we were, we were flying by. So this type of aerial survey, it's not like counting uh, you know, marine mammals or something where you've got you know, the occasional whale here or there. Uh, here you've got literally tens of thousands of animals. You have to take it slow and uh, take the video back to the lab to do the analysis. So what we're able to do then is we take this video and I'm gonna show you uh, a single 30 second clip of what this looks like as we're flying along here. And so as you're flying along, this is uh, when we first started our, our surveys back in 2011. Uh, this is what the video camera is seeing. You can see that uh, all those little dots on the screen, there's no way you can count this in real time. 
as you're flying along, there are literally hundreds of sharks um, in, in frame. And then you get into these large aggregations like the one I just showed you where there are literally a couple of thousand sharks right there. And there's, you know, it, you, it's an airplane, you can't stop. Um, and you just have to keep going and, uh, and collect the footage that you're able to use to count later. And I wanna emphasize that the water's nice and clear here. You're able to see these little dots quite clearly against the sandy bottom. And the other point I wanna make is if you look on the far left side of the screen, you see the road, there's A1A, right? There's the road, you can literally drive by and there's the sharks right there, all right? This is not, this is not uh, way off. This is right up against the beach where you have literally thousands of these sharks. And that's what captures people's attentions. And that's what gets so much of this uh, uh, media interest on these, on these uh, sharks. And so what we're able to do is take this footage back to the lab. Uh, we go through and we count it. Um, unfortunately, there's no automated way to do that. We still do it manually, just counting little dots on the screen and then advancing the video, counting more little dots to see how many sharks there are. And uh, we collect data that looks something like this. So starting on the bottom here in 2011, so when we started our surveys, we've gone through 2021, although I don't have uh, the most recent data on here yet. And you have the numbers of sharks along the y-axis here. What I wanna point out is that you've got a huge number of sharks on a, on a single flight followed by next to nothing. It drops off precipitously to hardly any sharks at all in, um, uh, about April or so, then there's hardly any sharks throughout the rest of the year. And then you've got a big jump, a big spike in shark abundance again, and then it falls off. And we basically, we stopped, um, we stopped looking after a couple of years in, in the summertime because there were just no sharks there. And so we just focused um, more flights in the wintertime to capture the, the spike as we, uh, as we went along. Now, for some years, there's been um, a little bit of a decline. This 2013 year, uh, in that year, we actually had uh, a lot of what's called beach renourishment. This is when they take sand uh, and they pump it onto the beach to build up the beach to combat the natural erosion that takes place down here. Well, in the process of building up the beach like this and pumping all this sand all over, they make this enormous silt cloud that extends for you know, miles along the beach. And so as a result, we simply can't see anything. Um, and so with 2013, there were several of these beach renourishment projects and uh, our numbers were low artificially because it was just too murky. You just couldn't see what was going on, okay? And, uh, and you can see in 2014, it bounced back up again. You had uh, big numbers of, uh, of sharks again, okay? Now, the other point I wanna make from this is that with this seasonal influx of these sharks, you can correlate that to what's happening in the environment. And if you look at water temperature, you can see that uh, the shark abundance is an inverse relation with water temperature. So for example, you have lots of sharks here in the wintertime when the temperature is low. In the summertime when the temperature is high, there's no sharks. Temperature starts to drop, sharks start to bounce up again. Okay, so one is up, one is down. Temperature and shark abundance are inversely correlated and it's, it's a highly significant uh, relationship. I'm not going to give you any stats. I'm just going to tell you uh, general stories here today. And so what you can see then is that these sharks are really only here in big numbers when the water temperature is below uh, a certain threshold. And in fact, you can plot that. You can look at numbers of sharks by water temperature, and you can see that we only get the big numbers of sharks when the water temperature is below about 25.2 degrees Celsius. Okay. So anywhere below that, we're getting large numbers. Anywhere above that, we're simply not getting the, uh, the big numbers of sharks, just a few scattered uh, here and there, all right? Now, here's where it gets fun and interesting and terrifying. What we've noticed over the past decade that we've been doing this work is that our water temperature, the mean water temperature in January to April, when these sharks are here, the mean water temperature has been going up, up, up every year. This is a, a highly significant uh, slope here. This is a, a strong regression with a significant slope. Um, even if you throw out the highest values and the lowest values, it doesn't matter. Still a, a strong, significant positive increase. So water temperature has been creeping up in the past decade. Um, and uh, it's been creeping up significantly. It's like 23 and a half up to 24 and a half here, right? So that, that's, a, that's a one degree bump in the average winter water temperature down here in the past just 10 years. 
So if water temperature goes up, what does that mean for shark abundance? Remember, it's gonna do the opposite. Shark abundance, we've noticed, has been going down. And peak abundance has been uh, much lower now than it has been uh, historically. And in fact, this is that one anomalous year, 2013, all right? So that's, uh, it's, uh, it would normally be up here somewhere, but still, regardless, you can see that there's a, a, a strong negative trend for shark abundance, peak abundance to drop. And in fact, this last year, uh, the last year for which we have all our data, we didn't even break 2,000 sharks on a flight when we used to break 12,000 sharks on a flight, okay? And so this indicates that uh, these sharks are sensitive to what's happening in their environment. The, the temperature is a strong predictor of when these sharks are here. Um, there are other factors that come into play, and we can talk about those later, but we're going to focus on the temperature story for now. And what we wanted to do was say, well, you know, what happens after these sharks leave here? The sharks are here. Uh, in the winter time, we know that they come down here to South Florida. South Florida is the southern terminus of their migration. They don't go any farther than Palm Beach. They come down to about here, and then they go back north again. But we can only look at them with this aerial survey when they're down here. We, I can't keep flying all the way up the coast uh, to see where these sharks are going. And so the next step beyond this is to start to look at what these sharks are doing after they leave here. And uh, for this, we go out and we catch the sharks. Here's our, uh, here's our boat, our fishing vessel. And you can see uh, us using the drone to help us find the sharks. Once we locate uh, a bunch of sharks, we're able to specifically target that as a fishing area. We're able to drop uh, lines in the water to capture the sharks. And um, again, you'll notice how close they are to the beach. This is very shallow water and uh, how close we have to, uh, to fish to capture these sharks. Well, once we do this, we, we get our baited hooks, drop them in the water. Um, and once you capture the shark, you bring it up beside the boat, and then we're instrumenting it. And what we're doing are putting, is putting a satellite transmitter on the dorsal fin. So here you've affixed uh, what's called a spot tag, a satellite transmitter on the fin of the shark. That's my student, Beth. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's um, uh, affixed to the fin. You've got this uh, antenna that sticks up. And now any time that that shark uh, the fin breaks the surface of the water, that antenna is able to communicate with an orbiting Argos satellite and give us the location and tell us, okay, we've got a, a GPS fix on the location of this particular shark. It's right here. And uh, it beams that information back to us. I literally get an email telling me, you know, uh, here's the location of, uh, of these sharks. Okay. What we're able to do then is take all of this location information and plot it to see where these sharks are going as they're leaving South Florida. They're going away from where we can sample them easily and uh, looking at their uh, movement along the coast. And so in this case, you have uh, a shark instrumented in uh, uh, 2017. And you can see that we instrumented it in March and it sort of uh, made its way up the coast. Every one of those dots is a time the fin broke the surface and we got a GPS location on that shark. And it made its way all the way up here to uh, North Carolina by June, okay? So it's making its way uh, up the coast there. Well, when you do this for um, a sufficient number of sharks that you have a, a large enough sample size, you're able to look at the migration of these animals along the whole length of the uh, uh, Eastern seaboard. And that's what we've been looking at here. And so in this figure, and this is just a, a rough draft from a manuscript we're working on right now. Um, and I say it's rough because we've got all these points that are way off here in the ocean and some of these that are in the middle of the land where in the process of filtering this properly. But what I want you to focus on is just the colors, all right? February, March, April, this one we're, we're tagging these sharks in the cyan and, and light green colors. This is down here where they are at uh, in the wintertime when they're um, being instrumented with these transmitters. And then by the time you get into April and May, the light green and yellow, they're moving their way up the coast. By the time you get into uh, the summertime, July, August, September, they're all the way up to New York. All right, this is Long Island. They're off the tip of Long Island at Montauk by the summertime. And then in the uh, fall, by the time you get down to October and November, they're starting to move their way back down the coast here this way. And uh, December, November, December, they're right back down here where they started a year earlier, okay? So this is, uh, like I said, just a, just a rough draft of this figure. We're working on this manuscript right now. 
But what it does is it illustrates that the migration of these sharks goes all the way up the coast, all the way up to, uh, to New York. Now, what's interesting about that is we're not only getting location information, but we're also getting temperature information the whole time. All right? And so we're seeing not only where the shark is, but what's the temperature where that shark is uh, reporting. And if you look at the water temperature, you can see that the majority, like 50% of their time is spent at water from 22 to 23 C. And in fact, if you just sum these first three bars, it's like 83% of their time is spent in a very narrow temperature band from 22 to 25 uh, Celsius, all right? They are basically following their preferred temperature up the coast, up to New York. Then as it gets too cold in the fall, they follow that preferred temperature back down here again. And so these sharks seem to have a relatively narrow thermal preference. They like a certain temperature band and they will move wherever they can to stay within that uh, temperature band. And that's why we're seeing these dramatic shifts uh, along the coast. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Remember I talked about how the water temperature has been increasing and uh, we've seen a full degree Celsius rise in the winter water temperature down here. Well, uh, on a larger scale, as you're looking across the entire Eastern seaboard, if you look at the historic range of these sharks, historically, these black tip sharks have been reported to extend from South Florida up to about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. All right. And uh, you can uh, read the literature. They, they migrate up here um, in the summertime, and then they migrate back down to South Florida in the wintertime. And uh, they say you get an occasional stray going farther north uh, beyond Hatteras, but not, not very many. What we found, though, is it's not an occasional stray. It's, in fact, the majority of sharks are going much farther than that. The current range of these sharks is extending all the way up to, like I said, Long Island, New York. This is an increase of 50% over their historic um, migratory range. You know, where, where have they gone in the past? Well, they've gone, you know, just up to uh, Hatteras. Now they're going all the way up to uh, New York and make, coming all the way back down to South Florida again, right? And so they're actually going farther north to uh, find their preferred water temperature and then uh, coming back down south. And uh, they might not come quite as far south in the future because it might be just too warm for them uh, down here. But uh, the next iteration of this was to say, all right, we can see where these guys are going, but we wanted more than just a one season satellite tag. We wanted to look at uh, long-term uh, movements of these animals. Are they doing this repeated pattern year after year? And to address that, we needed to use a different technology. That's an acoustic tag. And for uh, an acoustic tag, what you do is you go, uh, this, you go catch the shark, same as always, but you instrument it with this acoustic transmitter. And for that, you make a, a little incision in the body cavity. You insert the acoustic transmitter. Think of it about the size of your, your finger. Insert that into the body, suture the shark back up again, um, turn it around and, and let it go, all right? And so now the shark is swimming away, but it has this little pinger inside it. It's going ping, ping, ping with this unique ID code. And it pings every couple of seconds, all right? And so what this does is it allows us to look at the movements of these animals over multiple years because these are long life transmitters. These things last from anywhere from six to 10 years. And so uh, these sharks, if they're making these migrations year after year, up and down, up and down, up and down, we're going to be able to detect them for multiple years making these, uh, these, same, uh, these same movements. And so what you are doing with these acoustic transmitters is you're taking advantage of the fact that there are literally hundreds of these acoustic receivers all along the, uh, the uh, eastern seaboard here, from the Keys all the way up to Canada. Um, these things are anchored to the seafloor, and uh, they just sit there and they listen. They listen for any of these transmitters to go by. And when any shark with a transmitter goes by, that information is recorded by this uh, receiver and it's logged. And what we do is we come down here, we dive, we, uh, we pull them up, and we uh, download the data. And so it looks something like this. Here's your receiver. It's anchored to the seafloor. It's got a float to keep it upright in the, uh, in the water column. And anytime a shark with a transmitter swims by, that shark is pinging out, that little transmitter is pinging out. And the receiver uh, logs the unique ID code, the date, the time, all that goes into memory. 
And uh, what we do is we come along every, uh, about every quarter, every, every uh, three months, we come down, we dive down, we pull the receiver up, we download all the data off of there onto our laptop, then we dive back down, and we put the receiver back onto the uh, float, and then we go back and uh, go to the lab with all of our data. And all the receivers are doing this. There are uh, uh, this collaborative array of uh, FACT, the Florida Array, and ACT, the Atlantic Coast Array. Everyone is part of this um, collaborative, <coughs> excuse me, collaborative network where we share our data. So if we detect someone's uh, uh, tarpon, uh, we tell them about it. If someone detects one of our sharks, they tell us about it, okay? And so with all these hundreds of receivers along the coast listening and uh, these sharks instrumented, we're able to sort of piece together the, uh, the movements of these animals. Now, what you'll see here is the latitudes at which we've been detecting these uh, sharks. And what you'll notice is, is for these uh, sharks, um, the 52 black tips that we've instrumented down here in South Florida, um, a large number of them are going all the way up to uh, New York or New Jersey, or at least Delaware. Um, and uh, you know, some of them, we don't detect them anywhere past where we, where we instrumented them. And I don't know if this is a mortality, they get eaten by something. Uh, regardless, we don't detect them anywhere uh, past here. If you don't make it past Canaveral, but uh, a large number of them are making it uh, much farther north. And it's not a one-way trip, it's a return because we are able to look at the, um, uh, the repeatability of this year after year. And so this is starting in uh, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, et cetera, okay? And the, the dark, think of the dark as the winter, uh, spring, and then uh, summer is dark again, and then fall is light. So summer and, um, excuse me, uh, winter and summer are dark bands, spring and fall are light bands. And what I want you to notice here is that these sharks are at low latitudes, the pink colors, all right? And then they go up to high latitudes, the purple colors, and then they come back again. So here you've got a low latitude, it's instrumented down here, right? this example is 27. Then it went up to high latitude, all right? And then it, in, the, in the dark band here in the summertime. And then by next winter, it was down here in the low latitudes again. And then by the following summer, it was up to high latitudes again, back to low latitudes, back to high latitudes. This shark is making this trek up and down, up and down, up and down repeatedly, uh, year after year, time after time, to um, uh, you know, basically to, to follow its preferred water temperature. Well, the, the next iteration of this, we've looked at it with the satellite transmitters. We've looked at it with the acoustic transmitters. Uh, we wanted to actually, and we looked at it from the air. We wanted to get the, the one thing that was missing was like the fisheye view. What are we seeing with these sharks underwater? And uh, for that, what we wanted to do was a really simple technology. It's called a block cam. It's literally a GoPro camera uh, affixed to a concrete block with a float so you can find it again. And so what I do is we go out and we, we start the camera recording, we lower it over the side and we drive away and we leave it. And we just let it record for about 90 minutes is how long the battery lasts in the little GoPros. And uh, we basically just see who swam by. And so now anytime something swims by, the camera's gonna record that in the next 90 minutes and we'll get an idea of uh, who's going by, not just the sharks, but also the bait fish, their, their prey as well. And you get fit, uh, footage that looks something like this. Uh, and again, remember this is really shallow water. This is right up against the beach. We're, we're dropping these cameras at 50 meters, 100 meters, 150, 200 meters off the beach. So you know, pretty shallow in the same area where we do the aerial surveys. And you get these, um, these, uh, these schools of black tip shark streaming by. Now from this video, we're able to gather not only the uh, shark abundance, like I said, we do these every couple of weeks. And so it gives us this uh, regular sampling period. We're also able to look at prey abundance, the little bait fish that they're feeding on. We're able to confirm that these are in fact black tip sharks. You know, all the ones that we're catching when we're fishing are black tips, but these at large aggregations of black tips are not something else. And we're also able to get an idea of the distribution of sex in these sharks. And uh, what's interesting is it's almost 100% males. We don't have any females in these large aggregations. These, uh, these massive schools that you're seeing, you know, 10,000 male black tip sharks. 
based on our fishing and based on the block cam uh, information that we're able to gather uh, this way. All right. So what we've been looking at then briefly, we've been looking at the aerial surveys. We've been using satellite transmitters. We've been using acoustic transmitters. We've been using block cams to look at what's happening with these black tips uh, when they're down here. And uh, the nice thing about the block cams, like I said, is it gives us not only the black tip abundance, but also the abundance of their prey items. These black tips are predators. When you have a large number of these uh, black tips streaming down here in the wintertime, you have 10,000 upper trophic level predators um, feeding on something. And that's what we're able to do is uh, use these block cams to collect that sort of prey abundance uh, data. But the black tips aren't just predators, they're also prey. These sharks are not particularly big. Um, they cap out at less than two meters total length. They're not particularly a, a big shark, they're just an average sized uh, shark. I tell people that I'm five foot nine inches tall, and these sharks, our average shark is about five foot nine inches total. So they're about the same size as, uh, as me. If, uh, if I'm standing up and you stick a shark right beside me, it's about the same size. And what, uh, what we're interested in is also what role do these sharks play, not only as predators, but as prey. And so here you've got an example of a great hammerhead shark cruising along. And there's one of these schools of black tips. And what do they do? They bolt. When they see that big hammerhead come in, they just skedaddle. They want to get out of town. And what you'll notice is when they do bolt, they tend to go, um, in this case, to the left of the screen toward the shallow water, toward the beach, uh, rather than uh, the deeper water where the, uh, where the hammerhead is uh, swimming here. So here you've got these, these sharks that are uh, prey, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, predators, but they're also prey to even bigger sharks. And if you take a look at uh, this sort of interaction, here you've got a hammerhead that actually starts to chase a shark. And so you can see the hammerhead coming in and actively chasing the, uh, the, um, the black tip, trying to get it and putting forth a good effort until the, uh, the black tip, the smaller uh, black tip actually goes into very shallow water up against the beach. The hammerhead has to turn around. It can't follow. It's, it's physically too big to get that shallow. So the uh, black tips are using the shallow water as a refuge to stay away from these larger uh, predatory uh, sharks like that. Um, like the uh, like the uh, the great hammerheads, and so what we wanted to look at now, and where we're starting to move, is to look not only at the um, uh, the black tips, but also what are the hammerheads doing? And so for that, we're doing the same thing. We're going out, we're catching the hammerheads, we're bring up the, bringing them up beside the boat. We're instrumenting them with uh, satellite transmitters as well, so we can look at the movements of the um, hammerhead sharks as as you know, they're doing their thing. Are they, are they following the black tips of the coast? Are the hammerhead just sort of staying here year round and taking advantage of this annual feast of uh, black tips that, uh, that come to them? Um, you know, we don't know. We, uh, we just started this work. So hopefully we'll be able to get a good idea on the movements of these hammerhead sharks and the movements of the black tip sharks, overlay them to see what sort of uh, overlap there is. If the, uh, if the sharks are basically doing the same thing, or if they're off doing their, uh, their own thing, all right? And just to give you one more example of this, we know that these uh, hammerheads are going after these uh, black tips. You can see them accelerating and, and chasing down the, uh, the black tip sharks. And the black tips, like I said, they're about the same size as me. So these hammerheads, they are, you know, these are four meter hammerheads. These are you know, three meters, you know, these are three, four meter hammerheads. They're, they're big sharks uh, chasing, these, uh, chasing these black tips down. And we also know that I haven't shown you any of these events, but they are successful. And here's one where we actually did get to see uh, something which was absolutely incredible. Out on the water one day, a hammerhead did get a black tip. And these hammerheads, like I said, they're so big, they don't care. They will swim right up beside you. They know that no one is eating them. They know they are the apex predators in this environment. And uh, they're not scared of the boat or anything. They'll swim right up to you. Uh, as opposed to the black tips, they're so skittish, they just bolt. Um, but the uh, hammerheads will swim right up to you. And we got this incredible footage of a hammerhead swimming by with a dead black tip in its mouth. And you watch what happens here. Here you can see the hammerhead swimming by. I, this is a GoPro on a stick, just stuck it over the side of the boat. 
and there's a hammerhead with a dead black tip in its mouth. But then watch what happens. An even bigger hammerhead comes up behind it right here. And this even bigger hammerhead approaches that first hammerhead that killed the shark and actually causes that first hammerhead to drop it, drop the fish. And so that even bigger hammer here, I'm telling my student Ryan, drive the boat, drive the boat. And I can stick the camera back in again. And we stuck the camera back in again. And now that bigger hammerhead took that black tip, about the same size as me, and uh, took it down head first, uh, gobbled down the whole thing. All that's left is a bit of tail sticking out of its mouth right there. Took the whole thing right down. And there's that hammerhead that killed it. Um, who got nothing for his efforts, right? And so uh, again, uh, we know that these black tips, like I said, are, are prey to these hammerheads. We've seen it firsthand and uh, uh, clearly they have an important ecological role, not only as predators, but also as, as prey. And that's what we're starting to look at now is the role that these uh, black tips are playing as, uh, as prey items. And hopefully that's what we'll see uh, going forward. Well, I'm going to just end, and I've, I've tried to make this a short talk. Um, by reminding you that, you know, in certain times of the year, you can have people on the beach and sharks in the water like this. You've got literally, you know, hundreds of sharks right off the shores where the, uh, the tourists are coming down every winter time, all the snowbirds. Um, so all these people from New York and New Jersey do the same thing as the sharks. They come down to Florida in the wintertime, spend a few months down here, then in the summertime they go up north again. That's exactly what the sharks are doing. And uh, you have a, a good coexistence of people on the beach and sharks in the water. And I think one of the reasons we have so few bites down here is we are fortunate to have very clear water. Um, we have the Gulf Stream current that comes closer to shore in, uh, in Palm Beach County than it does anywhere else on the planet. And so you bring in this warm, clear water right up against the beach and then uh, on its merry way. So because these sharks are able to clearly see and distinguish a person from a little bait fish, the people for the most part are left alone. We have relatively few bites down here compared to somewhere farther north. You go up to like Daytona area, that's like the shark bite capital of the world. And they have much more turbid water up there. You have these sharks migrating past there every spring and every fall on their way up and on the way back. And uh, you have all the people in the water and that's where people get bitten just because it's, uh, the sharks simply can't see. They simply don't have the same... Uh, uh, ability to resolve uh, visual detail that they have uh, down here in South Florida. So we're, uh, we're fortunate to be here. And I remind people that, yes, there's lots of sharks here. But if you see them, consider yourself lucky. Uh, give us a few more decades, and you probably won't see them this far in, uh, anymore. So I'm going to wrap it up at this point. And uh, I acknowledge the Colgan Foundation. The Colgan family has been uh, very generous in supporting our work for uh, close to a decade now. And I encourage you, if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, Instagram, uh, follow us. We are at Shark Migration. And we also have a presence on Facebook called FAU Shark Migration. And uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, leave it off. And hopefully the, uh, there are some, some questions and we can talk uh, sharks in general at this point. So thanks once again. And so sorry, Kears, for the, uh, the late, uh, late start on this one. No, not at all, Steve. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us and the great presentation today. Um, for anybody who has any questions, I see a few that are in the chat, so I can uh, go ahead and go through those. Um, but if anybody does want to unmute themselves and just ask Steve a question directly, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, I'll start by going through a couple of the questions in the chat here. Uh, the first is from Ray Newman. Um, he said, is this essentially uh, a Western Atlantic population of black tips uh, or is this a stock and uh, are there other populations say in the Bahamas and the Gulf? Right, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. These ones that we're looking at are just the ones that uh, hug the uh, US Eastern seaboard. The ones in the Bahamas are largely separate and the ones in the Gulf, of the Gulf of Mexico are separate. And in fact, they're genetically distinct uh, populations in the Gulf of Mexico compared to the Atlantic seaboard. Um, now, the other question though is with, uh, within this Atlantic population that goes up and down, we don't know whether there are little subpopulations, all right? Um, and what we can say is that there are nursery grounds for these black tip sharks in North Florida, in Georgia and South Carolina, you know, various places along the uh, coast. But we don't know if it's one large pandemic population, whether there's a distinct subpopulation in North Florida, distinct subpopulation in 
you know, South Carolina or something, right? Uh, what we've been doing is for all the sharks that we capture, we take a little tiny fin clip so we can do the DNA work on it. Um, and hopefully that will help to address the question of whether the sharks that are aggregating down here are part of one large population, whether we have discrete subpopulations. And uh, uh, stay tuned. We're, we're still collecting samples and, and we haven't analyzed it yet. Yeah, great answer, Steve. Thanks. Um, so uh, kind of in line with that, you know, you've got the, the, the video that you take, you know, from those block cams and you're, you're saying the vast majority of them are males. You can tell by their claspers, I would imagine, right, as they're swimming by. But do you have a hypothesis on where those females are at? You know, it's, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I wish I had a, a better answer for you. Um, I can tell you my own little pet idea, which is probably, it's wildly speculative, but um, here goes. It's, it's the, uh, the pregnant woman waddling hypothesis. So uh, mating takes place in the summertime. These females are gravid for the next, you know, the next several months, the next year, close to a year. Um, and when it comes time to migrating, these males um, are migrating all the way down here. The females we think are not making it quite this far. They basically stop maybe around Cape Canaveral or something and don't make the full extent. And it reminds me of watching a couple with a, a husband and a wife and a pregnant wife. And you watch them walk together. And what happens? The husband pulls out a head and the wife doesn't quite keep up with him because she's bigger and rounder. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a similar sort of scenario happening here with these pregnant females uh, not devoting as much energy to the migration um, and just, you know, uh, devoting more energy to gestation. Um, yeah, I, I don't know this, like I said, it's wildly speculative, but uh, that's one hypothesis for why I'm guessing the females are simply not making it this far south. We know that they're together in the summer times, that's when the mating takes place. Um, but then uh, in the winter times, they're, they're clearly uh, sexually segregated. And uh, that's about the only thing I can come up with that might might be an explanation. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess this is a question that uh, comes from that answer is, I mean, when you look at other uh, shark species, do you see uh, schooling and segregation of males and females? Uh, so is this something that, you know, might kind of span, you know, outside of just black tip right. populations into other schooling populations of sharks? Right. Yeah. Uh, various sharks have been demonstrated to have this sort of sexual segregation where males and females are, are separate. Uh, sometimes it's by depth. Sometimes you have male uh, sandbar sharks, I think, were deeper than the females who are shallower, you know, things like that. Um, I, and I, unfortunately, we don't know enough about the migration of these, of, of other species to say whether these sort of migratory patterns are, are uh, similar or not. Um, we know depth segregation, but we don't know about uh, north and south sort of uh, distance, uh, at least I'm not, not that I'm aware of. We certainly don't have as much data on anything else. Uh, right. We're able to get a lot of data from these black tips just because there's so many of them right up against the beach, uh, but we don't have nearly enough information from other species. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, and then I'm just gonna kind of go through a few other uh, uh, questions here and I might add something to this one a little bit. So um, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, uh, this is from uh, Har Harshini. Um, when you say historic range, you know, like how far back in time are oh, we yeah. talking here? And then, you know, it seems like your data is pretty kind of straightforward, you know, like you, you see the increase in temperature and the decrease in shark abundance, but do you think there are any longer scale cycles that could play mm -hmm. a role in that, you know, kind of uh, piggybacking off of that question a little? Right. So uh, when I say historic, I'm talking about uh, literature from the 1940s, right? That's not that long ago. It's like, what, uh, 70 years ago, right? 70, 80 years. It's not, not that long in the grand scheme of things. But to see a, a shift, you know, like a 500-mile shift in the span of, you know, seven decades, that's, I think that's a dramatic shift in the, the distribution of these animals uh, compared to what we're seeing now. And I can even speak just anecdotally to some of the fishermen who are telling me about locals down here saying, oh, you should have been here in the 80s. These sharks were down in, you know, down off, uh, you know, Miami or something. Uh, and we're not seeing them down there anymore. And say, yeah, you're right. You're not seeing them down there. Um, and we're seeing them farther and farther north. Uh, they're simply shifting their distribution. And in fact, when we started, you and I care, we used to fish out of Boynton Inlet. We used to leave out of Boynton Inlet and do our fishing. Now we're 
going uh, in the north, we're going out of Palm Beach to do our fishing. And recently we've started going out of Jupiter to do our fishing. The, the sharks are literally moving, you know, even as we, uh, even as we're doing this research. So I think it is a, a dramatic shift and you know, it'd be interesting to look at long time scales. I intend to keep flying and fishing as long as I can. I'm not going to retire yet. So uh, I've got a couple more decades of work to, to do here and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to collecting a bunch more data. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess another question that comes in here from Brendan Nee um, is, you know, it sounds like their prey items are relatively small. Um, so I'm not sure if there's, you know, any tracking on them uh, specifically, you know, whether or not people are putting pingers in them and, and tracking them using that trend, the, the acoustic array or not. But, you know, have you seen any uh, similar migration changes in those in those prey items for the black tips? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and that's something that I, I again I wish I had data on. Um, I I simply don't know. Um, we can correlate the shark abundance to water temperature, but clearly it's I don't think it's just temperature. Clearly they you know it's important that they be where their food is, right? And so I'm guessing that there's a certain amount of uh, you know the the prey are also responding to you know primary productivity which is increasing in, you know, at, at higher and higher latitudes and um, having prey abundance probably shifting, which might be contributing to the, the sharks uh, shifting as well. But uh, we, we don't have the data. I, I, wish, I, I wish I knew. Uh, sadly, I can't give you an answer to that. Yeah. And then I guess uh, there's another question here, but I'm going to ask one too. Um, so, you know, they do have like acoustic arrays that looked like from one of your um, uh, figures there, there was, you know, some transmitters off of the Bahamas and some other areas, you know, the Bahamas are, you know, maybe Bimini's what, 90 miles or something like that from the coast. And so do you think that it's, you know, the, the Gulf Stream acts as a pretty big kind of barrier in a way, right? Um, but um, so do you think it's, it could be a, a culmination of a lot of things, but do you think it's the, the pressure from the prey items and large pelagic species that keeps them maybe from going back and forth and isolates them along the coast? Or do you think it's following, you know, just prey or, or because right. you would think that they could just go to a little bit greater depth to get out of those hot uh, kind of summer temperatures. So, um, right. yeah, what's right. what's causing them just to kind of isolate along the coast there, and and why don't you see kind of you know any any crossing over to the Bahamas? Because you would think that there'd be tons of prey yeah. items there for them to utilize as well. It, it's interesting because uh, the people at the the shark lab in Bimini have also been tagging uh, black tips and we don't see their sharks over here. They don't see our sharks over there. None of these tagged individuals have, have made the uh, one, one made one made a, a crossing, but of all the, you know, dozens and dozens of sharks that have been tagged, uh, you know, one weirdo made it, the rest never did, never made, never made that crossing. And I think it's largely, uh, you know, these sharks are not big sharks and crossing the, uh, crossing the Gulf Stream, that's where the big boys are. And we actually have some data from a couple of uh, our instrumented sharks. And I didn't talk about these. We have data loggers as well. These are packages that you affix to the dorsal fin. They record high resolution data, temperature, depth, a, a 3D acceleration, um, magnetic heading, all this information, um, light level, which is the important one. And what we've seen on a few of these that we've instrumented these sharks, these black tips with, is they've been, uh, these sharks have been eaten. And we know that because the package, the light level goes up and down day and night, day and night, then it stays dark for like a week. And then it finally pops up again. And so we know it was inside the belly of someone bigger until they you know, uh, regurgitated it. Um, and so I'm guessing that that's what happens to some of these sharks that make these treks. Uh, and we also have uh, some unreleased video footage from a fin mounted camera where the camera's on the shark and uh, we see a big, I mean, it's, uh, I see a big bull shark basically come in and cut that shark right in half, um, the, the black tip. And so you see the, the two halves of the black tip sink away as the camera's floating on the surface watching it. And so I think, you know, remember that these sharks are, they're not big sharks, they're average sized, you know, human sized sharks and there's much bigger ones out there. And so I think that has to do with the fact that uh, we're not seeing uh, this sort of crossing the, uh, uh, the, the Gulf Stream. It's only 50 miles, but it's a, it's a nasty 50 miles to go across. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I can only imagine if there was uh, some uh, 
uh, I guess, uh, sound on that video of the great oh, hammerhead. You hear it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I would have probably heard you guys yelling a little bit too. That's a pretty sweet video. Um, and so this kind of goes hand in hand with the, what you were talking about there. Um, uh, Yin, uh, Yifeng asks, um, uh, for the transmitters, uh, do fixes only occur when they breach the water, you know, or are they, uh, only, do they only transmit when they breach? Um, you know, not sure, right. they're not sure how often right. they breach. And so they're wondering like, about the fine scale movement patterns, you may right. you already kind of touch base on this, but you know, are there advantages to certain technologies uh, versus others, and disadvantages here and there? And yeah, how? Right. Uh, yeah. So with the uh, with the satellite transmitters, they only transmit when the antenna is out of the water. So the fin has to break the surface of the water, then it talks to the satellite, and you get a fix. And it it can be quick. It doesn't have to be out of the water for a long time. It can be fairly quick. You know, just you know, several seconds enough to. Uh, transmit a signal. Um, but you're right, it doesn't capture um, all the times those sharks are moving when they're they're underwater, right? And so you can go for literally weeks or months with no hits, and then suddenly you get a bunch of detections because the shark is, you know, fins up again. Um, and that's why we, we supplement those satellite data with the acoustic data. The acoustic data, those pingers are going all the time as well. But uh, the nice thing about the acoustic data is that uh, the shark is oh, always underwater. The, the transmitter is always underwater. So it's always you know, uh, signaling. And as long as it's near a receiver, it's going to get picked up. Now, there you have the, the downfall that you don't have a full range of receivers along the whole you know, eastern seaboard. Uh, you have you know, little areas of, of receiver coverage. But uh, it does give you more of a continuous coverage than does a satellite transmitter. So they give you two different things. You know, one works when it pops up. One works you know, the whole time, but you need to be near a receiver. So there's, there's trade-offs. There's, uh, you know, you need to use different technologies to get this sort of comprehensive understanding of what these uh, sharks are doing. The one other factor I would throw into the mix is the satellites are not always overhead. There are certain times when the satellites are just moving in such an orbit that you end up with blank periods uh, where, where there's no satellite coverage. So even if the shark was out of the water, if there's just no satellite coverage there, on occasion, you just don't get those hits and you just you miss those data. So that's one other uh, one other wrinkle to throw into the, uh, the, the mix there. Yeah, yeah, cool. I guess it's important to recognize you know, the utility of each one of those, right, and what they can tell mm -hmm. you. Um, you know, we also have a lot and, of- and like, Yeah, and recognize the limitations of, of each one and, you know, fully acknowledge that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'll, you know, at this point, um, if anybody else wants to unmute and ask a question or put something else in the chat box, uh, please feel free. We'll, we'll maybe answer one or two more questions there. But um, while we wait for that, I, um, I guess one question, you know, we have a lot of wildlife biologists as well, you know, in the Kansai department here in Minnesota, uh, landlocked uh, to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, some of the people who are uh, doing this work are relying on drone use uh, quite a bit more, you know, for um, tracking, you know, whether it be moose mm -hmm. populations or something like that. How has the use of these kind of drones, you know, really uh, changed your fishing or your research? It's, it's been a, a real game changer. So the aerial surveys are great because we're able to cover a large area. Um, but it doesn't give us the ability to stop, hover, and get that fine scale uh, information. What we've been doing with the drones is uh, using them to um, make our fishing more efficient. When we go out on the water, we're able to fly the drones. Oh, there's sharks over there. And so we go and we set our lines around them. And so that, that speeds up our ability to uh, capture animals. We also use it to collect uh, you know, not only interesting behavioral data, like the um, hammerheads chasing the black tips, but we have been collecting data on swimming kinematics of the animal. So you can hover the drone in place and you can look at things like tail beat frequency or you know, the velocity uh, of the uh, sharks. You're able to get some uh, swimming kinematic data that you'd be unable to get any other way. You can't keep a, you know, a three meter hammerhead in a tank somewhere. Um, you have to get that in the field, in the wild. And the only way to do that is by you know, looking at the animal from, you know, from this bird's eye view to look at this natural sort of swimming behavior. And so it's opened up whole new avenues, whole new ways of collecting data that were simply unavailable to us before. And drones are cheap, they're easy to fly, they're fun, and uh, they've, they've really sort of uh, been a game changer for us. 
That's great, thanks. And then I think there was a question, um, uh, James Forrester, I think I saw your uh, finger go up. Are you looking to ask a question? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one thing I was uh, thinking of in terms of how we've used um, drones for wildlife research that could be nice for you is just the ability to do repeated samples like fairly cheap of the populations. And so, you know, you could, instead of having to rent a Cessna and fly up and down periodically, you know, um, you could just drive that and then pop the drone mm -hmm. out every whatever, 10 miles, yeah. take some take some still images and then or, or video if you wanted to, and then analyze it. And it's something that could be done in a day and you could, you know, it's only the time and gas that, that it costs. Right. Yeah, and that's that's um, certainly been useful for us. We've also used them um, to uh, uh, double check with the the block cams. We drop those block cams in a fixed location, and so we will fly the drone up there and we'll park it over top of the block cam and and have it sit there and record video for fifteen minutes um, and sort of you know ground truth what we're seeing on the underwater video with what we're seeing from uh, from above. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with the uh, drone technology getting better and better. It's certainly only going to increase our ability to collect more data, you know, not just us, everyone, uh, to collect more data um, and uh, and do things that were prohibitively expensive before. Like I, like you were saying, you know, a Cessna rental is hundreds of dollars um, as opposed to a drone, which is you know plug in your batteries and you're good to go. You know, charge them overnight and you're good to go. So um, I think it's going to be a, a big you know, a big shift in how people do wildlife research going forward. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we are right up against uh, one o'clock here, at least central time. And uh, so I think maybe we'll just uh, end it here. But Steve, you know, always a pleasure. And thank you so much for joining us. We really uh, cool to see the work that you're doing. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing some updated data uh, 10 years from now or something. So. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us and uh, thank you everybody for joining us as well for the first Kansai seminar. Uh, we'll look forward to you all coming along for the rest of the semester here. So thanks again. Thanks a lot. See you guys. Right.